we've just concluded our prayer series called Pray First. And our prayer throughout this series is that we as a church, that we would pray more often, that we would pray more earnestly, that we would pray more readily, be quick to, to pray and to receive prayer and to pray for ourselves and for one another. And so prayer is a focus point for us. As we pray, we focus our attention upward toward God. As we pray for others, as we've done in this service, we focus our attention outward toward others. And so, so in prayer, whether focusing upward toward God or outward toward others, in both cases, it's away from self. And, and the, the, the sin nature, the, the human nature, is to be self-consumed and self-focused and, and, and to respond to life out of how we see things. But, but as the weather is turning, as the leaves have turned, as we're turning and shifting our series, and we've got another one starting next week, I want to pause in the middle of this. Because you're starting to see a lot of things turn. The stores are turning over the decorations. Who's noticed that? The music is changing in Walmart, right? And, and the, the mail is changing. It's coming more frequently in the emails, and suddenly everything's on sale. It's amazing. All of these things were apparently overpriced the whole rest of the year, and now they're finally going to give us a sale on them. And so, you know, Black Friday's coming, and our, our attention starts to turn toward preparations for family and, and receiving in that family that we've we've been missing and longed for and, and all the others that are coming too. And, uh, and we plan these Thanksgiving meals and we plan Christmas and, and our attention starts to focus on gifts and, and purchasing and, and our thought is things that we want to get and things that we want to buy and, and things that we don't have. And so we're, we're shifting our attention to things that out there, things that, that, that are not that we want to bring in. And I want us to just pause for a minute in this season and turn our attention away from those things. In a season focused on what I want to get, could I, could I focus for a moment on what I already have received? And, and maybe, maybe there's a perspective shift here that can help all of us. It's my, my hope today that I can turn our eyes, not, not our physical eyes, but our mind's eye, the, the eyes of our heart and of our spirit, our perspective in other words, our perception, not changing what we see, but change how we see. Change the us that's doing the seeing. There's a, an anonymous quote that goes back at least to the rabbis, uh, Jewish rabbis, just a couple of decades after Jesus. And it goes like this. It says, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. And how true is that? That, that it's, it's what's going on in us and it's our perspective of things that shapes how we feel about them and how we respond to them. It's not what's going on in the world. It's, it's what we believe about what's going on and really what's going on in us and how it affects us. And this, this very quote is an outflow of Proverbs 23, which says that as a man thinks in his heart, so he will be or so is he. In other words, the, the thoughts of my mind and the condition of my spirit affect who I am and how I respond and what I do. And also Proverbs 21, which says every man's way or everyone's way is right in their own eyes. I, I don't have opinions that I think are wrong. They're my opinion because I think they're right. Right? And, and the things that I do, I don't do intentionally because I think it's the wrong thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do. Or even if it's not the right thing to do, at least the Oreos will taste good. And so, so sometimes I'm, I'm compelled and I have compulsions that, that I believe there's a justification for satisfying, whatever that justification is. And, and I excuse myself. Even if I know it's not the right thing, I find an excuse and a justification because my perception of me is so high. I want to I shift our perception today. Because if it's true that we can shape our world through changing our perception, then how we see can change us. Shift our perspective, shift our life. In Romans, Paul says it this way, transformation comes by renewing your mind. We renew our minds to be transformed. In other words, we want things to change from the way they are to something they are not. We have to think differently. We need a new thought pattern. There needs to be a new us looking at the world not just a new world to look at. And so my goal today is to help us think differently so that we can experience life differently. 
because I believe God has so, so much more for us than we have ever thought or ever imagined if we will simply choose and make the choice to turn our eyes and turn our attention away from what we do not have to what he's already given us. So growing up, uh, there was a show on, on television called Sesame Street. Any Sesame Street fans in the house today? Who likes Sesame Street? Who likes some Elmo? Who li- and, the, and all these guys, they, they had, they had a, a name, right? These, these puppets had names like Big Bird and Bert and Ernie and Grover and Cookie Monster because I've already mentioned Oreos and now we're missing the Cookie Monster because it's a requirement of this church to get food in the sermon. So I just had to throw that out there. Um, so, but these guys all had a name, but there was this one character that every time they said his name, they not only gave his name, but they gave a, a de- description of his perspective on life. His name and his disposition and his character went together because he saw things in such a unique way, even on Happy Sesame Street, that they had to point out that he was not just Oscar. He was Oscar the Grouch. You guys all know this guy. Maybe you work with him. Maybe you've met him in Walmart. If you're in customer service, you've definitely interacted with Oscar the Grouch. Maybe today you're married to Oscar the Grouch. Don't raise your hand. And some days we can all be there. There are days that even my wife Michelle wakes up and I'm convinced she is married to Oscar the Grouch. (laughs) Don't don't get ahead of me. I've been married 24 years. I know better. Um, Sometimes. So anyway, our perspective shapes how we see things, does it not? Even even joy-filled child playland of Sesame Street was a great place to have a lousy day if you were Oscar the Grouch, who lived in a trash can because he liked trash and, well, rent was too high on Sesame Street. That's how he chose to see it. We could see things one of two ways, and our perspective will shape it. Perspective is everything, and according to Scripture, it even shapes our world. Because when it it shapes our our perception, it shapes our our words, and our words give life, and we can speak life or we can speak death over our circumstance. Today we're going to look at Psalm 116, and we're going to see a progression of perspective shift. We're going to see the outcome of that and, and the response or the resulting compulsion that comes from a different perspective. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll go back in and break it down a little bit. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol, or the grave, laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. What an awesome song of praise, psalm of praise. The Hebrew word for praise is hallel. And that's where we get the word hallelujah. Praise God. Hallel. Yah, praise God, hallelujah. And, and this, this psalm is part of the Egyptian Hallel, which is Psalm 113 to 118. And, and that's the celebration that, that's uh, sang or prayed every Passover as they remember God delivering them out of Egypt at Passover. That's what is celebrated. And so this is called collectively the Hallel, the praise. 
the thanksgiving of God's people for all his goodness and all his benefits. And it starts out with the psalmist recounting his condition. He starts out in, in verses 3, 10, and 11. He describes his suffering in verse 3. I was facing death. I was in distress. I was in anguish. Some translations, I was in trouble. I was in sorrow. Verse 10, I had great affliction. Very possibly he's, he's writing about being physically ill, physically sick, or having disease that, that he thought he might not recover or heal from. We know what affliction is like. Verse 11, he said, in my, in my frustration, my dismay, or in my haste, I said, all men are liars. Can't trust anybody. He's been rejected. He's been betrayed. Be betrayed. Have you ever felt that way? Just can't trust anybody. Expect people to come through and they don't. Expect people to honor their word and they don't. Expect people to return kindness for kindness and they don't. Who can you really trust? The psalmist was there. Have you been there? Maybe you're there today in affliction, in sickness, in anguish, in sorrow, in grief, facing death, facing the loss of a loved one, facing betrayal, facing rejection. God certainly knows how we feel. But in his circumstance, he doesn't focus on his circumstance. He shifts his perspective from his situation to his Savior. Verse 4, O oh Lord, deliver my soul. He, regardless of what's going on around me, I'm going to focus upward and say, God, you're my source. You are my deliverer. Verse 6, when I was low, you saved me. Verse 8, you dried my tears and kept my feet from stumbling. I want to focus on those th three things. When I was low, you saved me. In other words, you have pulled me up. You have pulled me out. How many things has God pulled us up from, pulled us out of? He says next that, that you've dried my tears, you've been my comfort, or you've kept me through. There are things that he's pulled us out, and there are things that he carries me through. And then next he says that you kept my feet from stumbling. How many times have I been in a situation that could have been destructive, could have been deadly even, and God kept me from harm? So many things I could look back in my life and say, God, there's times you've pulled me out. There's times you've carried me through, and there's things you've kept me from. And in all of these things, I see your hand, and I'm grateful. And so the psalmist cries out in distress. He focuses upward, and then he focuses on what God has done. And it, and it gives him thanks in his heart. And Paul tells us that in every situation, we are to give thanks. Paul and Silas in prison began to give thanks, and chains broke off of them. Circumstances have no hold on you. They were still in prison, but they were no longer bound. Think about that. When we begin to praise, shift our focus, it may not change our circumstance, but it'll change the us that is in the circumstance. At first, the writer focuses on his circumstance. He's in pain. He's in sickness. He's facing death and distress. In distress, he prays, O oh Lord, deliver my soul. Don't change my circumstance, change my soul. Soul deliverance from distress, from anxiety, from grief come when we focus on Christ, our deliverer. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace because it is trusting in you. How do we have peace in turbulence? How do we have peace in difficult circumstances? We keep our mind on him and our trust in him. And that's what keeps us stable in unstable circumstances. Trust keeps us stable and confident and peaceful in turbulence. If you've ever flown on a plane, if you've flown many times, you may have gotten by once or twice without it. But if you fly much, you've been in turbulence. And turbulence can be just a light bump or it can be a whole lot of big bumps. And I was, I was on a plane once that had a lot of big bumps, and I had no issue. I enjoyed it. It was like a free roller coaster. I didn't even pay for that part of the flight, and here I got to have this extra ride of up and down and the little feeling, woohoo! 
Now, why was I peaceful? Why was I confident? Because I've flown a lot. I knew what to experience. And I had trust in the plane. And I had trust in the pilot. I had trust in the situation. I'd been there before. I'd been carried through. I'd been preserved. I understood the dynamics. I knew what was going on. I had trust. Therefore, I had peace. But there were people next to me that were white-knuckling it. They did not have peace because they did not have trust. And you know what? I understand because I was on another airline once. And this airline used duct tape as a maintenance item. And I looked out on the wing, and as we hit turbulence, I saw the duct tape moving and coming off. And I was getting very concerned. I did not trust this airline. I did not trust this pilot. I wasn't sure about their mechanics. All of a sudden, my peace is gone because I no longer have trust. You see how that changed? The circuit, the turbulence is the same. But the experience can be completely different based on our perspective and based on the condition of the eyes of our heart. Am I seeing through trust? Am I seeing through confidence? Am I seeing knowing God's hand is on me? My life is in his hands? Or am I seeing all the things around me? Am I focused on what's around or am I focused on who is above and what is within? The old song says, turn your eyes on Jesus. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Prayer moves our eyes from our pain to his promise, from our fears to his faithfulness. And the next thing the psalmist does is he begins to remember all the times God has been faithful in the past. He begins to recall all that God has already done. How soon do we forget what God has already done? How soon do we forget what people have done? How many of you remember what you got for Christmas five years ago? Four years ago. Remember every gift you've been given? We forget. We, we think we're grateful at the time because we say thank you, even if we don't like it, because that's what you do and we're being nice. We, we say thank you and so we believe we're grateful, but are we truly grateful if two years later we no longer look at that item with appreciation for that person in our life, but it's now just part of our stuff? And how often do we do that with God? God provides for us, but once we've had it a little while, it's now just part of our stuff. They say that's even a trick for compulsive shoppers. If you're, if you're tempted to, to shop compulsively, just take something and put it in your cart and walk around for 20 minutes in the store because mentally you'll think it's yours and then you no longer want to purchase it. You only wanted it because you didn't have it. And then you can easily put it back and not spend the money. How fascinating is that? Psychology is amazing. We are amazing human beings. And how quickly we forget, how quickly we adapt, how quickly we feel ownership of things that were not ours, that were gifts from God. And so 150 times throughout Scripture is the word remember. He says, remember and never forget. And then a couple of chapters later it says, remember that I told you to remember and never forget. And in the next book, it says, remember, I told you to remember that I told you to remember and never forget. Why does God have to keep reminding us to remember because we forget. We don't live every day aware of all he has already done. We, we put that in the past. We, we take it for granted, and we're just moving on to what we want right now because our focus is still not what we've received but what we desire. I hope to shift our focus from that a little bit today. The heart focused on receiving is never satisfied, and therefore it's never truly grateful. How much do we take for granted? How God has pursued us. Day after day. How great is his undeserved favor over our lives? What has God done? What has God already done in your life? I'll give you seven things just from this psalm, real quick. We'll go through them quick from verses 5, 6, and, five, six, and 7. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And there's even more than seven just in these three verses, but seven's the perfect number, so we're going to go with these. Number one, grace. Gracious is the Lord. We don't deserve grace. That's what grace is. It's undeserved favor. It's who am I that the highest king would welcome me? But while I was yet in my sin, Christ died for me. I got what I never deserved. I don't earn grace. I can't deserve grace. But he freely gives it. How great is his grace. Righteousness. Even though I don't do right by God. Even though I don't do right by his word. Even though I don't do right by other people. 
He always does right by me. For even though I am faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot disown himself. God is a faithful God. And not only is, is he righteous even when I'm not, but he gives his righteousness to me. He, he aligns me when I am out of alignment. In fact, he, he says, let's make a trade. Give me your unrighteousness and I will give you my righteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he, being God, made him, Jesus, to be sin. He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On that cross, all my unrighteousness, all my missing the mark, all my sin was on Christ. And for a moment, he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a moment, he felt and experienced that disconnect that exists between him and God because he took on my sin because I was disconnected. And he said, I will take the distance and in its place, I will give you my connection. That now you are one with the Father. Now you are one with him as his child. As I am the son, you are now sons and daughters. He took in him our unrighteousness and imparted to us, placed on deposit in our life or our bank account, if you will, all his righteousness. When God sees me, he doesn't see my missteps. He sees Christ. He sees the righteousness of his son. He sees his own holiness and says, you are my beloved. Do I even know what took place on that cross? Oh, his righteousness. Such great favor in our life. Number three, mercy. If grace is getting what I don't deserve, mercy is not getting what I do. How many of you are grateful you don't always get what's coming to you? God has been so, so good to us. Thank God we don't instantly suffer his wrath for our selfishness, for our unbelief, for our disobedience. But he is patient toward us not willing that any should perish. Thank God the judgment hasn't come on the earth yet. Every extra day we get is redemptive time for more to come to faith and come to know him because he is patient, not willing that any should perish. Preservation, how he has kept us. He has kept us here. There's many of us in this room, myself included, that there are moments that I could have been gone, but God protected me. He kept me from something. As much as he's brought me out of things, and as much as he's carried me through, there have been things he's just kept me out of. But not only that, he's kept me in him. When my heart, when my sin nature would wander away, he relentlessly pursued me with a reckless love. He never lets me go. He keeps coming after me day after day. He preserves me. Salvation, not only redeemed from my sin, but no longer a slave to my sin nature, no longer its servant. I can walk in a new life, no longer free, no longer bound. We no longer have to be slaves to addiction, no longer have to be slaves to certain thought patterns. We can be free. We can have a new mind and a new life. We are saved. Number six, rest. Again, this goes back to he gives us peace and he gives us rest. He is our comfort. He sent his spirit to be our comforter. He returns us to safety. Number seven, provision. My God shall supply all your need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Ask and you will receive. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. There is nothing that he will withhold from those whom he loves. God is so ready to provide. In fact, his very name is God, our provider. He is our provider. He's provided everything we need for health and life. Think about these seven things. If if we walked over Thanksgiving and over Christmas, just over the next two months, if we could possibly, as a church and as a, as a people, just walk through this season and walk through this time, every moment aware of even these seven things that God has given. His grace, he's given us. He's given us mercy. He's given us preservation. He's given us righteousness, salvation, rest, provision. If we, if we kept those things in mind, would they not change our outlook on the world? Our outlook on our current situation? It's said, attributed to Albert Einstein, but maybe it goes back further than him, we don't know. It's said there are only two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle, and the other is though everything is a miracle. I can, I can go everywhere looking for God, or I can see God everywhere I go. And the difference isn't where I go. The difference is how I choose to see. The difference is 
the perspective? Do I walk in gratitude? Do I walk in remembrance? Do I walk overwhelmed by his goodness and his blessing in my life? Once we turn our eyes, we then turn our desires as well. If I turn my eyes to all that God has done, now it requires a response. When I feel that the overwhelming uh, uh, sense of, of blessing and favor in my life, then, then, then selfishness has to go away. Because where selfishness asks, what can I get from God? Gratitude asks, what can I return to God? The carnal, line, carnal mind asks, what can God do for me? The, the, the human natural mind says, what can God do for me? The spiritual mind acknowledges God has already done so much for me. God, you don't have to do one more thing for me to know you're God. You don't have to do one more thing in my life for me to trust you as provider. You don't have to do one more thing for me to obey and honor your word. You don't have to do one more thing for me to trust in your love, in your salvation, in your grace. You've already done more than enough. What does he have to do still to convince us that he is with us and he is for us? The grateful heart is just overwhelmed with what he has already done. And the psalmist cries this out in verse 12. Uh, a heart over, overcome and overwhelmed with gratitude cries out, What shall I render? What shall I return to the Lord for all his benefits to me? The life aware of all his benefits, overwhelmed with his goodness, must respond. So... What will I return? What will you return? What are you returning to God for all his benefits? Think about it a moment. We know what God has done. What will you do? What are you doing? And honestly, it's a tricky question. And it's a tricky passage even to preach because... At first glance, it could seem transactional. God gives to me, so I give to him. And that's how human relationships work, right? Quid pro quo, right? You give to me, I give to you. We pat each other's back. Mutual admiration society, everybody's happy, right? But that's not what's being said here. It's not what can I return because you've given to me. It's, it's not in that sense. But neither is it rhetorical. It could, it, could, it could seem that way. What could I ever return to God? I mean, almost as though the answer is nothing. I mean, what does a holy, all-powerful, all-knowing creator God need that I have? There's nothing I have that he's in need of that I can provide for him and his, and his life be better off because I gave to him. It, but, but it's not rhetorical. It's not transactional and it's not rhetorical, so what is it? What can I return to God? And the, the answer to the question is actually a twist. Because look at verse 13. For all his benefits to me, what will I return to him? I will lift up the cup of salvation. What an odd response for all his goodness to say, God, for all you've given me, I'm just going to keep receiving. I'm just going to lift this cup because I know I could never fill it for myself. I couldn't save myself, and I can't keep myself. I'm not my source. I'm not my provider. And I'm going to lift up a cup in thanksgiving for your salvation. In other words, the heart of gratitude says, for all your blessing, I'm just going to, I'm going to remain in your blessing. It's actually the ungrateful heart that says, God, thank you for all these blessings. I'll take it from here. I'll do things my way now. I'll go my own direction with what you've provided for me. Do you see that? But the grateful heart says, for your blessing, what shall I return? I'll lift up the cup of salvation and I'll say, keep filling me, Lord. Keep me under your provision. Keep me under your protection. Keep me under your preservation, your grace, and your mercy. Five things real quick that we can return to the Lord. There's, there's more. Lift up the cup. Remain under his salvation. We just mentioned it. Number two, call on his name. Pray first. Seek first the kingdom. Put him first in, in everything, in our time, our talent, our treasure, our testimony. We'll hit that in just a minute. Call on his name. Number three, keep my vows. Obey his word. I'm, I'm going to do what you say. If I'm truly living a life aware of all your goodness, that life is just going to do what you say. Because I know that you're the source, you're the protector, you're the provider, you're the preserver. You pull me out, you carry me through, you keep me from. I'll stay on your path because that's the path to life and to safety and to blessing. Number four, I'll gather with his people. Twice in this passage he says, I'll do this in the presence of your people. 
Gratitude-filled hearts, grateful hearts, hearts overwhelmed with God's goodness and blessing and favor, they come together and they join together with other believers. We don't say, thank you, God, for blessing me. I'll keep it all to myself. No, we join together. We share our testimony. We encourage one another in faith. We pray for one another. We give to each other as we have need. We gather together, and we don't forsake the gathering together. And number five, we offer thanks. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We're thankful to him. We bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. We can go through our life. We can go through our every day overwhelmed by life, or we can go through our every day overwhelmed by Christ. It's our choice what we're going to choose to focus on. We can look at this whole psalm and, and we can see a recurring theme that brings us to the real response here. The real response of a heart overwhelmed with all God's blessing is found in verse 2, 13, and 17, the beginning toward the middle and, and end. I will call on the name of the Lord. Because he hears, I will call. But again, there's a twist. I'm not calling because I know he will hear. It's because he has heard that I will continue to call. It's for all he has done. I will keep my life under him. It's not a requesting this calling on the name of the Lord. It's a positioning. I will keep my life under his name, honoring of his name. Because he hears. This calling is a response. It's not about our voice. It's not just a prayer. It's an invitation. God, be in my every moment. Be in my life. For all your goodness, for all that you have poured out on me, preserved me from, pulled me out of, carried me through, kept me from, for all that you are to me, God, for all your greatness, for your undeserved grace, for your mercy, for your preservation, for your rest, your peace, your comfort, for all of this, God, just be present in my life. And may my every moment honor you. In other words, when the video clip, the... the, the the moments of my life are, are played when they're posted to YouTube or Facebook or when they're posted to Instagram and, and we put a caption over them, is the caption, Jesus is Lord. When, when, when a clip comes of that business transaction you just made, is the caption, Jesus is Lord. When, the, when, the, when the, the video clip of that interaction you just have with your spouse or your kids is posted, is the caption, Jesus is Lord. When the video clip is posted of that meal, that conversation, that conduct, that thought, when that, if that got posted for the world to see, would the caption be, Jesus is Lord? I will call on your name. Your name can be posted over my every moment. And this is what, what Paul says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... The eyes turn to all of his goodness. In view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. Not just singing, but giving, shaking hands in the foyer, going to work on Monday, interacting with your spouse, with your kids, in everything, live a life, a sacrificial life that says, my life belongs wholly to you for all you have done for me. In other words, when he's given his all for me, what part of me would I ever withhold from him? When he's given his all for me, what part of me will I withhold from him? My time? God, I thank you for life, for another day. I thank you for healing me, and now I have the energy to get up and go do things. I'm going to enjoy some stuff that you might not want to be part of. Thank you for this time. I'm going to use it for me. God, I thank you for my time, but I don't have time to, to pray today. I don't have time to read today. I don't have time to go to church today. God, thank you for this beautiful weather. Thank you for this beautiful nature. I'm going to go hang out in it instead of coming to church. Pretty nice day, Lord. I'm sure you'll understand. I mean, would I really withhold my time if, if he's the source of my time? My talent. God, you've given me that contract. You've given me the mind that's been able to make these decisions. You've given me the ability to have these deals. You've given me favor with people and enabled me to be successful. You've given me my physical ability. You've given me the ability to, to perform that labor or that service. You've given me these things, God. And I'm just going to use them for me because I, I want to enjoy the things that I do for myself. Or, or am I using my talent to, to, to bless others' lives and to give back to God and to his house? 
What, what of my talent am I using for the house of God? What of my talent am I using for the people of God? What of my talent am I using for people that need to come to know God? Am I withholding it when he's the source of it? My treasure. <laughs> I love this. God, you've given me all I have. You're my source. Again, you've given me the ability to be successful in whatever venture. You're my provider. I have what I have because of the gifts you've put in me, the opportunities and favor that you've put before me. And I thank you, and you've told me to enjoy 90% of that and just return the first tenth to you. But God, uh, I like the 90. That's a great start, but I really want your tenth too. It would be all right if I just hold on to that? Seriously? Seriously? I mean, I, I wonder if God says that in his heart sometimes. Seriously? What would I withhold if he's the source? You know, it's, it's kind of like this. When you go shopping at Christmas, if you remember this, maybe you did this as a child, or if you're a parent, you've done this with your kids. And you go shopping for mom or for dad, right? So dad takes the kids shopping, and they buy something nice for mom. Mom takes the kids shopping, and they buy something nice for dad. And whose money are they spending? They're spending mom and dad's, right? None of them have a job. And so, so they're there, and they are buying. And, of course, you know, it's easy to spend when it's not yours. Dad, we should get mom a new car. Yeah, I think you get a job. That would be great. That's a great idea. You know, they're big spenders with your money. It's always easier to give what belongs to somebody else, is it not? But it's when we feel that sense of ownership over it, when we think it's ours. But if everything we have is, is his, and if it comes from the authority he has over our life, if he's the source of it, and he's saying, I just want you to bless one another with it and honor me first, how much easier does it become then to give? You want to make it easy to give your time, talent, treasure, and testimony? Then just realize they're all already his. It's all his. And he says, I want to give it to you, and I want to bless you, and I want you to enjoy this favor. I want you to feel freedom. I want you to know grace. I want you to know righteousness. I want you to have what you do not deserve. I'm withholding you from you what you really do deserve. I want you to have favor. I want you to have rest. I want you to have healing. I want you to have provision. I've given all this to you, and I bless your life that you could have a blessed life, but that you could be a blessing that I can bless others through your life.